You're going to remember this every day for the rest of your life. If you want to get to a goal, if you want to get to your dream, you got to focus on all the little steps. You have to put in your time. You have to be patient and you have to enjoy the process. Whatever you're doing now, whatever you want to be great at, whatever you want to be special at, I'm sure you, you may be already be good at it, but to be extraordinary, you have to do extra. I firmly believe that we are all here for a very specific reason, to do something truly extraordinary. But what are you going to do to get there? Welcome to the Magna Method Podcast, and I am so pumped up for this. Look, this is one of the people on this planet that you that will blow you away if you spend a second with them, spend a, an evening with them. And I've been very fortunate to spend time with them at dinners, uh, weekends with with friends. He's an incredible person, uh, great family man, and just an iconic figure in the world we live in today. I'm so pumped to have. Buddy Velasco on the show. Welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, thanks, Mark. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, listen, that, that's why we get along because you're. I have a lot of admiration and respect for what you do. You're disciplined. Um, just you know, it's funny how, how when we first got to know each other, we were staying at a friend's house in the Hamptons, and me and him were the only two up, like first thing in the morning. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I remember I, I woke up in the morning. I, I was getting up early and I said, this is great. And uh, I, w- I was about to have a cup of coffee and I'm going to get a workout in before everyone gets up. And someone's already up. And I looked at him. And I said, well, wh- why? Like, I was, I was like, like, borderline offended. I was like, well, why are you up? And he said, remember what you said to me? I said, I'm a baker, bro. I yeah. said, I get up early yeah. every day. Yeah. He's like, I'm a baker. I always get up early. I said, no. I said, but we went to bed. So, we went to bed so late last night. And he said, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I always get up at the same time. That's it. It's like clockwork, no matter how late the night is or how crazy it is. And uh, I think once that happened, we we had a, a much different respect for one another. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> we talked, and I was thinking at the time, that morning, it was a Sunday morning, I believe, you told me like the best stories ever. And I was thinking, man, I was just kicking myself the whole time. We talked for about two or three hours, and you, uh, I think we went through a couple of pots of coffee, but you... Um, <laughs> it would have been a great podcast way to try to do that today so absolutely i i just wanted to you know start off by you know of course we want to get into the show and whatnot but what fascinates me one of the things you said when we originally met buddy was you actually started working in in your dad's bakery at a very young age so tell us about that in the start yeah yeah absolutely so you know i started working when i was about 11 years old I mean, the truth of the story is I actually got in trouble from my dad because uh, me and my buddies, we were 11 years old and we got a pack of matches and we were in the woods playing around and we got a little like little campfire thing right. and the cops wind up coming and we ran and hid in the woods and the cops on, on you know, on this microphone's like, well, I got your bicycles, so I know you're going to come <laughs> out and we're like, shit, we, we, we got to go and uh, we went back home and the cops brought me home and told my parents that I was playing in the woods you know with, with, with matches and I got the crap kicked out of me oh, like you yeah. know like oh, I deserve yeah. to and my dad said to me as a punishment on the weekends now you're going to come to work with me and um, he never said like you have to be a baker he never said like this is what you have to do he said I want you to come there and learn work ethic I want you to know what it's like to get up every day and be a man and have to go to work. And I loved my dad and I idolized him. So it wasn't like like a punishment for me. It was really right, like right, I was right, excited right. to go. And my first day at work, I'll never forget it. I walk in, go to my dad. I'm like, all right, what am I? You know, I'm all excited. We he used to have a, uh, a Dodge Ram van and we used to deliver it and stuff. And we're driving in the Dodge Ram. And I'm like, Dad, you know, what, what am I going to make today? Cookies, pastries, cakes. You know, I was excited. I, I thought it was going to be fun. And he uh, brought me in the bathroom and he said, clean the toilet bowl. Oh. And uh, it's a true story. I was like, really? Like, you know, and, and again, look, I grew up in a household where it was very Italian. I had four older sisters. but I'm, I mean, I was babied. I, I never picked my plate up from the table in my life. You know, I've always been catered to right, right. by by my sisters and my mom you know right, i was right. the baby italian family yeah, it was like old school italian so i didn't even know how to clean the toilet bowl 
And my dad looked at me, he goes, why, do you think you're too good to do it? And I said, no, because I knew that my dad would have done it. Right, right. And he looked me in the eye and he said, you got to take as much pride in cleaning the toilet bowl as if you're making a wedding cake. And he said, whatever you do in life, son, if you do it to the best of your ability, you're going to always be successful. And I got down on my hands and knees and I scrubbed that toilet, man. And it, I mean, it was mirroring because... You know, um, and I think he did it for a couple of reasons. I think he wanted to show me that lesson, but I think he wanted to show the other workers that just because I was his son, of course, I wasn't going to get special treatment. So after that happened, um, <clears throat> what happened was I started to go every weekend and I started to get good. And I started, you know, by filling pastries, making pasta chuts, then making cakes. And by the time I was like 14, 15 years old, I was like, this is what I want to do for a living. Like, I loved my dad. That's awesome. I loved the family business. And um, it really was less... In the beginning, it was more because I wanted to be like my dad. You know, if your dad's a cop, hey, you want to become a cop. Right? My dad was a baker. I want to be a baker. But it was because of the cake decorating. And when I would, when I make a cake, I go into what I call a zone. And I put my heart, my soul, everything I got. The room goes quiet. And I just am so focused on what I'm doing that I don't hear nothing. I forget my problems, my pain. I mean, I could actually slow my heart rate down so that my Everything. hand doesn't pulse. If I'm doing like little, little tiny details and it's about common and common and you finish and you step back and you look what you created and you get that feeling of self-worth, you get that feeling of, wow, this is what I was born to do. And I wanted to get that feeling for the rest of my life. Right. You know, so at, I was lucky enough at the age of 14 or 15 to be able to say, hey, I want to be a baker. Right. Like, you know, th right. this is my dream job. And I think that in life, if you don't love what you do, and, and you know this, Mark, you are never going to be successful. No, no. You know? I see so many people go to work and I'm thinking, if you don't like to do this, and I understand like, hey, I got to pay the bills, Mark. What am I supposed to do? I understand that. But figure out what will give you a lot of self-worth and give you a lot of reward on your investment because you spend the majority of your time at work working you've been in miami i've seen you for a couple dinners now in the evening for a few hours but you've been working the whole time here you're in a tight schedule well absolutely i mean and again that's that's what goes along with the right when you get into the other spectrum of like you know tv and years of, of whatever you know people always say to me man you know you don't got to work so much and i'm like I work harder now than I ever did in my life. I'm sure. I'm sure. I said, you have no idea what I still do to this day. Um, and But, yeah, listen, it's, it's what you got to do. And, and I think that because that foundation of being a kid and being a worker, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't phase me. Right. Like, like, it's like, okay, so you want me to stand here and take pictures and, and, and hang out with my fans? Shit, that's easy. You right. know, I, I could be digging ditches. Right. Like, I... I and then, you know, taking pictures, laughing, hearing great stories, hearing how what I do inspires people. How how could you not want to do that? Exactly. You know, um, it, it's just I wasn't raised that way. I, I think it's very interesting that, you know, I come across a lot of people in my field that they want to have a certain level of greatness and they want to achieve certain things. But they don't understand, as you said, with you, it was cleaning a toilet bowl. With me, it was cleaning the floor at a corporate gym after I played in the NFL. And I was like, I got to do what I got to do, whatever it takes. Like, this is what's in front of me right now. I got to focus on this if I want to get there, right? And, you know, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who understand that. I mean, you know, think about that. Focus on You that. played on, in the NFL and now, you know, you're cleaning the floors of the gym. I mean, and 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 honestly, I think that's why we get yeah. along oh, so sure. well because sure. cause we're humble, you know, no matter 100%. what. You, you know, and, and to this day, I'll never forget, it was about maybe two years ago. I'm a neat freak. I mean, look, I'm definitely obsessive, yeah. compulsive. Yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, I could see the crumb in a corner. And you can see this guy when he gets dressed up. I mean, everything looks perfect. I mean, <laughs> one of the best dressers I've ever met. I'm serious. So I, I know what yeah. you mean by that. So like uh, when you could eat off my floors at, at my bakery, at my at my house, like this is the way I live. And um, I wind up going to, uh, I wind up coming in. I was away. I was filming in Brazil for like three weeks. 
Okay. And I got back, and I the the factory was really really busy, right? And things weren't as clean as I like them. And my guys were like, "Yeah, but we were so busy, whatever." And I said, "I don't give a shit." And I stopped production for three days, and we cleaned that bake bake shop with toothbrushes. Like, I mean, the corners, like where it was crazy. And I had a new employee. And, you know, I'm there at six in the morning. I'm scrubbing yeah. floors with people and whatever. And this the guy who was working in um, in the office came in. He goes, I, I cannot believe that you are here doing this. He's like, I am perplexed and baffled, like, beyond. He goes, I can't even imagine that this is what you're doing. Um, and I said, well, if, you, if I expect my employees to do it, then I have to be able to do it. If you're going to be a general, I'm the general that's going to go to war mm-hmm. with my guys. I'm not going to be the general oh, that's sure. going to be saying, all right, you know, you guys go fight. We're going to hang out back yeah. here. And um, it dovetails back to, you know, my story of my dad bringing me into the business in a young age, showing me that you have to respect your elders, showing me that you have to respect your employees, showing me that if you want to if you expect things of them or expectations of them, you got to be the same way. Right. You got to be the first one in. Oh, for sure. You got to be the last one for to sure. leave. You know, yeah. and um, when my when I was 17, unfortunately, my dad um, got diagnosed with stage three cancer. I'll never forget. It was my 17th birthday. Oh my God. I go with my mom. We, we get my license because in New Jersey, you get a license. We drive to New York City because my dad was in a hospital. We walk in and he was crying and he just got the news. Um, And then we decided that I would drop out of high school to help run the business until he got his chemo treatments, you know, maybe a month. Again, I mean, by that time, I was... I was really that good, and not not that no, pat myself on the so back. So many reps, so many reps. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, exactly. You know, I mean, I was making wedding cakes when I was fifteen years old. I remember being creating them the way you do now. Not to the, le- I mean, right. not to what it is today. Right, of course, right. I'm better, but right. I, I was I was doing it. I remember when um, a cake would fall or get you know not get made or broken. My dad would tell my sister, "All right, take your brother. I'll be fourteen years old. Go to the bakery and make this cake." And because I wouldn't drive, it was, you know, 20 minutes away. And my sister would take me and I was a 14-year-old kid. And I would put it together and be able to do it because I didn't. So, you know, so I was already doing it. And then after he got diagnosed, he got diagnosed on March 3rd. March 21st, he died. And now I lose my dad. I lose my best friend. I mean, uh, and everybody's looking at me to fill these shoes. Like everybody, and, and, and you're every, 17. 17. And my dad was like the greatest man on the planet. Like yeah. he walked on water. He could do no wrong. Right. So, you know, I had a lot of people like saying, oh, this business is, this place is going to go out of business. Of like, course. you know, yeah, yeah. you know, and um, it, I had a really rough three to four months. And then one day I just, was driving and then I said, you know, and I was crying. I was just crying in my car and I was driving and I said, I'm not going to fucking fail. I said, I am not going to fail. And I went to that bakery day and night, seven days a week, you know, first one in, last one to leave. The bakers who knew more than me, I humbled myself and begged them to teach me. And I just started absorbing and absorbing, absorbing. And I just, I said, I'm going to be the best baker on the planet. I said, now I'm going to, I'm going to work. So, Cause again, my theory of how to make it happen was work. Like, time, so, so time. yeah, my, my, the way I look at things is I could outwork my problems and I'll just put the time in and I'm going to work and I don't give a shit and I'm going to keep going until it's done, you know? Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's funny because now there's certain problems that I can't outwork. And I'll I'll get to them right, like right, right. kind of later in the story, but it took about like three years of me really working hard mm-hmm. to really get the reins of the bakery, like to really like you know all to right make now create a system. Right? Everybody's in line, mm-hmm. um, and and I respected everyone, and I was there all the time, and I I mean I knew every single nut and bolt and 
cookie and where things okay. were. Like, you know, I was just so yeah. involved in that bakery that I was like the heart of it, you know? So uh, about three to five years after my dad died, a lot of bakeries like mine were going out of business because of supermarkets. Oh, wow. That's you right. know, I mean, it, because it again, within the supermarket, right? Yeah. And you know, I, you look at the analogy, right? You think about it and, and we're similar age. So we know it. There was a generation that would never buy the meat from the supermarket or the fish yeah. or the, or the baked goods. Right. You know what I'm Specialty trying to say? Like shops, right? Yeah. You had to go right. to these places or whatever, but then it was like this wave in the nineties where people were like, all right, screw it. I'm, I'm going to go one-stop shop. I'm going to get it all here. Same and, time. And and to the, to the credit, they were cheaper, and and their product was getting better mm-hmm. over time. You know, it was really garbage, and then it got better, a little right. better, a little better. So, um, I said, I'm not going to fight with these guys over pennies. I said, well, I'm going to try to sell the donuts for a dime. You know, I, where, where am I going to make money? There's right, no right, money right. in it. I said, I got to make things that they can't make. So I, I called up my supplier. I said, "Give me a bucket of that fondant stuff." I said, "Let me let me teach myself how to make it." So I started a bucket of what? The fondant. It's like uh, it's like a sugar play dough. Oh, okay, understood. So understood. it's kind of like you know, like all the trendy cakes were being done with this. Okay, okay. I never used it, so I said, you know, let, me, "Let me screw around with it." And then you know, I started to start to, to play with it. I didn't like it. Took it apart. Did it again and again and again. And I started to get good at it. See. I'm very good at a couple things. I connect the dots. And once I learned this skill, like when I roll out dough with a rolling pin, I'm a master. It feels like the rolling pin is part of my body. I don't even think about it. It's like, you know, the way it's funny because I I, I did a cooking show and in the cooking show, when I was chopping the onions, you know, I was with the culinary chef, and I'm not a chef. I'm a right. I'm a baker right. by trade. Right. But the culinary producer said, the minute you picked up the rolling pin, she's like, it was just magical watching you work with a rolling pin. She's like, you just knew it, and the way you moved the dough, it was like because it's like walking. You know how you're walking, yeah. you don't think about right. it. Effortless. Well, it's effortless. Yeah. So I started to apply that. Well, I found on this dough. You have to roll it out. And blanket over the cake. So I had the rolling pin skills. And then I had the piping skills. And I had the things. And I connected those dots. And I've always been able to, if Mark is a great baker, you know, and Randy is a great decorator, well, I that's what you do. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You mm-hmm. put people where they're going to excel. You know their abilities. I'm sure you know it with the trainers too, yeah, right? Absolutely. absolutely. So it's like, hey, if, if Khan's good at, at the boxing and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Why are you going to let them do something oh, yeah, else? Yeah. Hey, do what you're good at. Do what you're going to excel at. Um, and that was kind of like my business philosophy and and what we started to do. Um, so once I started to get the cakes working and stuff like that, I uh, a girl walked by my bakery one day. I had a beautiful cake in a window. And she comes in and she goes, uh, I, I think your wedding cakes are beautiful. She said, I work for Modern Bride Magazine. I'd love to feature it. Wow. And I was like, holy shit. You know, I was like, Amazing. wow. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. yeah, this is like a dream come Excellent. true. So I made a wedding cake and then I brought like four bags of cookies, cannolis and stuff because I wanted to butter up the editors. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I'm a businessman. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, this is the other thing that people don't realize about me. I've been my own publicist, PR person. You did all those roles yourself forever. I, I, you just for, started. Forever. Nobody's going to sell know, Buddy Valastro like Buddy Valastro. Exactly, exactly, you know what I'm exactly. trying to say? And, and you know you I know exactly know. what you're trying same, to do. Same. So it was those relationships going there, showing them that I was reliable. That I was, Yeah, that I was a good person. That I, I, I didn't, you know, because again, they would work with certain um, bakers who were like more artists. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh no, I'm not gonna make that cake. Yeah, yeah. Like, tell me what you want. You want yeah. me to make it blue? You want it yeah. pink? What do you want? What do you want? Makes you happy? That's what I'm gonna do. And again, and, and no one wants to check their ego either. Exactly. I didn't have an ego about it. I would say to them, but think about it. They have a vision of what they want. I want this page to look like this, and it's gonna be out in the woods, and there's gonna be greens, and there's gonna be flowers, and whatever. And this is what we want. To, 
they would almost draw the cake for me. All right, you want to make this cake? No problem. You need it here tomorrow? Done. Whatever you want. So they loved me. So for three years straight, I was in that magazine, every single issue. Like not even a maybe. They're like, all right, what are we going to do this month? Or what are we going to do that month? Because of the relationships, right, right, you know? Right. And then once you're in one magazine, then this magazine wants you. And, you know, it's pretty sad because the bridal magazine industry in the late 90s and the early 2000s was a booming business. Right, right. It doesn't even exist anymore. Right. It, it's crazy. Why is that? Because nobody buys magazines. Everything's online. That's right. They, I mean, you know, it's funny. You think of the internet, how many yeah. businesses are killed. It's like the Death Star. The <laughs> it really out. is. It's a, it finished it. But thank God I was at the right time. And, and you know, I was in all these different publications. And um, then they started doing these cake decorating shows. Now, mind you, Mark, never in a million years did I say, hey, I want to be the cake boss on television. Right, right, right. It was never. I wouldn't think so. It was never like, oh, this is what I want to be. Like, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So I get a call and they're like, hey, we're doing these uh, cake competitions. We saw you in a magazine. Do you think you'd want to do it? And you know me, I'm a competitive guy. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm going to do it. Of course I'm going to do a challenge, you know? So I did my first challenge. And it's funny because at the time, I was really a wedding cake baker. So I didn't really do the sculpted crazy cakes that I do now. Mm -hmm. You know, I did these beautiful wedding cakes. It was right. more what I mean, that's where the business was. Right. You know, and being in the New York area, there was always a lot of weddings, so it was good. And um they they uh the first two competitions I did, I got my ass kicked. Like there was really artists who did sculpting and different things. I it was out of my league. And Do you remember what you did the first one? I did. I did uh, it was a Christmas, it was a holiday themed one, and I did this big like giant holiday wedding cake and then i put like these sugar flower poinsettias was beautiful but this guy next to me made like santa coming out of a chimney hanging out like rudolph flying down so it was like apples and oranges you know um but look i'm big enough to admit when i'm you know when i when i gotta lose like if, if i gotta lose if i made a cake and it looked like shit i'll tell you it looked like shit or i don't need anybody to tell me also too at the time i didn't know the mediums that these guys were working with i never really used modeling chocolate which is like tootsie roll and so think about taking a tootsie roll and molding it into something because it'll hold its shape right or rice crispy treats or different things i mean i would i mean it was just basically cake and fondant that's all i used understand so um I would begging the producers. Again, it goes back to that selling yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Guys, you got to put me in a wedding cake competition. When you do wedding cake, like straight up wedding cake, I'm going to kill people. Like that's what I, you know. Right, right. So I, I went to the producer, Art Edwards, and I said, you got to do it. And he liked me. And he's like, all right. we The third challenge was a wedding cake challenge. So now I'm like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I said, now I can redeem myself right, because right. I knew that, it was on. Right. So I go and I do this wedding cake challenge. I make this beautiful four-tiered flawless cake and a groom's cake. And I finish two and a half hours early. Ooh. So I'm sitting back having coffee. <laughs> My cake is, is beautiful. I mean, it was like fishing with dynamite. It, was like, it wasn't even fair. I'm looking up the aisle and these cakes are like lopsided. They look like crap. And I'm like, I won. I'm like, this, this is it. I, I killed it. Right. And... I'm standing there and they're like, you didn't win. And I was like, Dude, I was so, so aggravated. Oh, no. My heart Bad. was broken. You know, I, I think I got penalized because I didn't like, you know, because I was done two hours early. Oh, really? And I don't know what, what happened, but. Um, Who won? Um, I, I, it was a, a girl won. Uh, I forgot her name. But um, I, I mean. I should have won that one. And I'm big enough to admit it. The first ones I was in, no way I should have won. I I should have lost. So I'm in my kitchen and I'm cleaning up and I'm mother, mother, son of a bitch. You know, I'm I'm like enraged. And the camera guy who was filming me all day, his name was Tony. Tony comes in and he goes, hey, you know, buddy, you were great today. I said, yeah, Tony. I said, how the hell did I lose? He said, you know, he goes, no, not your KQ. I said, well, what are you talking about, Tony? He goes, you pop off camera. He says, you're casmoratic. He says, you need a television show. And I started thinking, 
holy shit. Never even thought of it, huh? No, I never, never it even never thought. even crossed my mind because I thought it was in, I, it just, you know, that, well, I just figured going to these competitions would help my business. That was always the goal. Mm-hmm. And then I said, I got a hundred year old bakery. I make these crazy cakes. I got a big, crazy Italian family. I said, and I go to work every day and I laugh. Like, like the people that surround me in my world, like the town, the this, it's funny. Like, like and the right, customers but, too, the same yeah, customers. The, the customers, the, the the neighborhood, like it's it's really funny. Right, right. Um, and I said, you know, maybe this could be a television show. And I, I'll never forget this. I went home to my wife. Because I was in Col- I w- no, I was in Tulsa filming that. And I okay. flew home from Tulsa, laying in bed with my wife. And I said, you know, Lee, I said, the guy Tony told me that I, I need a television show, you know. And I kind of like rolled over because I don't want to hear him be like, oh, another crazy idea. You got so much shit <laughs> yeah, on your plate. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I really was. <laughs> you, you know, I don't oh, got to tell yeah. you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you can understand that. And, and she turned around to me and she said, you will. And I rolled back and I was like, what? And she said, well, to be honest, I hate you for it. But anything that you set your mind to, you do. She says, you don't know how to fail. She says, and if you really want to do this, you're going to do this. Wow. And that's what she tells me, like when I'm down or whatever or whatever. And she's like, buddy, Velasco, don't fail. That's amazing. And she know, you know, and it goes back to that switch in that car ride when I was crying and I said, I'm not going to fucking fail. And, and, and again, my brain processes is all right. Do we go this way? Do we do this? Do we do this? And I'm building shit in my head of what I'm going to do, whether it's a cake, whether it's an idea, whether it's a system, whether it's a um, marketing campaign or, or television show idea or whatever. And um, so now I got the blessing from, from my wife. And I'm like, all right, it's on. I'm going to go get a television show. And the story gets so funny because I call a food network. The the shows are on food network. I'm like, listen, I got your next hit TV show. I go, me, my bakery, my family, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, "Um, we just signed a deal for a cake show that we're following. Keep doing challenge, buddy. So I was like, ah, shit. And then that show came on the network and, and it was Ace of Cakes. Who actually now Duff and me were friends. And right, right. We have a new show coming out in a couple of weeks, oh, cool. which is pretty cool. We went head to head. That's gonna be awesome. That's gonna be epic. Um, but I saw his show and I said, I called up Food Network. I'm like, yeah, you know, but my show's a little different. It's a family, you know, it's it's a hundred year old bakery. I said, those guys are great, but we're different. It's not the same thing. I said, listen, there's really not room for for two yeah. cake shows on a network. They're like, keep doing challenge, and I did. I won one. I didn't win one challenge, so I'm always happy about that. I should have won three. Uh, I'm not bitter, but <laughs> but, but, but I should have won three. And then um, it's funny. TLC was looking for a cake show because they saw the success of Ace of Cakes. So I said, well, why can't we do one? Mm-hmm. I mean, again, that's what all the right. networks do. Always you know what I'm trying right. to say? Like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Let's copy Anything it. Anything you can do, I can do better, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they started asking bakers to send in tapes. The person who who won that third competition, the one that I lost, the mm-hmm. one that Tony said I pop on camera. Right. She sent the tape in to get the show. They watch the tape and they're like, who's that guy? <laughs> True story. True story. It's it's 2008, November. I'm standing upstairs in my decorating room where I used to make all my cakes. On my bench, it was my corner, the windows right, behind right. me. My sister Mary's like, TLC's on the phone for you. TLC, who, the band? I'm like, who the hell is TLC? You know, I don't even know who it is. <laughs> it's true. I swear to God, this is a true story. I pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, you know, buddy here. And they're like, oh, this is TLC. And, you know, we're, we we saw you on, on some footage. We were thinking of doing a, a cake show. What do you think? I said, well, look, I have a great idea. I said, it's me, my 100-year-old bakery, my family, my this, my that. And they said, all right, take a camcorder, run it. Drew the bakery. Hey, I'm Buddy. This is my bakery. This is my mom. This is my sister. And send it to LA. I did. The next day, they called me. They're like, we want you. Who's your agent? Oh, so man. I was like, and again, I'm in the production business now. So I produce all the television shows that right. I star in. 
And actually, Art Edwards, the guy that I told you, um, is my partner. Right. So me and him own Cake House together, and we produce my shows and other shows and stuff like that. But um, I, it doesn't happen that way. It, like, usually you go to a production company, like a High Noon or to right. a Cake House, and you're like, hey, can you do a sizzle? And then you go to a show, and then, like, it just doesn't happen that a network clips you calls you and then no. I, I actually got high noon the got the job because they were like oh now we're gonna partner you with the production company and i said well now i really want to work with high noon because me and art right we, we we spoke about the show like we have an idea and then whatever so they talked to art and they spoke to to high noon and i got them the the gig that's sweet um and then cake boss aired in 2000, April of 2009. And after the first month of airing, we were the number one food television show ever on cable. We beat out. All, oh, after one month? After the first month. We had crazy, crazy ratings. And then, you know, the, now Cake Bosses did 12 seasons, over 300 episodes, aired in 225 25. 225 countries and territories all over the world. That's incredible. Du dubbed in 45 languages. Number one lifestyle show for TLC or Discovery Worldwide. Seen by over a billion and a half people. That's ridiculous. And it's like, holy shit, pinch me. Like, like, like this is my life. Like, I, I can't even imagine. It's unbelievable. It's been semi kind of fast, no? It's I mean, 10 not years. your story. You've invested your entire life, but the, the television side has popped, right? 10 years, man. And then, you know, once you do another show, then you did Next Great Baker. We did Bakery Rescue. We did, um, uh, we did, uh, uh, Kitchen Boss. I mean, I've done like seven, eight shows. I filmed all over the world. I've traveled all over the What's world. What's that like? What's that like when people see you on the street? Because when I we have dinner, people come to you all the time, and they always want to take pictures. And you're, you know, there are some people out there for for our audience who don't like to take pictures. I've never seen Buddy deny a picture. I've never seen him not enthusiastic about taking a picture. So kudos to you because that's incredible. Oh, I appreciate well, really, that. Really, what's it like for you to be so... I mean, I heard the story you went to Brazil as a mall as 30,000 people waiting for you. Yeah, no. I, well, again, there's two, two parts to it and I attribute it to my parents. Mm -hmm. My parents raised me to never forget where you come from and they've raised me to say, hey, if somebody is, you know nice to you or going to be willing to wait for you like then you got to reciprocate yeah like you know when i see a kid who's 12 years old who's looking at me and shaking and crying because they they love me on television and they're looking at me and they want me to be superman well i want to give them a hug and tell them i am superman right. and i am here and right. i and, and and you know be that person for that kid or for for that you know, that fan, because again, you know, I can't change who I am. And listen, you've been around me, whether I'm on television, whether I'm here talking to you, right. whether I'm out, we're having dinner like we were last right. night, is I'm the same guy. Right. And it's not in my DNA to say no to a fan. Or big time people. Or, oh or yeah, people. no, yeah, I, I just, it's not who I am. It's not in my DNA and... um I think the fans know that and they respect that. And I think that that's why right. um, I've been able to be successful. I, I think it's uh, that that's one of the things that I've always been taught from a young age. You want to find out who someone's really, who for someone really is or what they're made of. It's not take everything away from them. It's give them power. Yeah. Give them celebrity status. And then you find out how they treat people, right? They give them a high level of respect. Uh, a trainer who was started off scrubbing floors and now the trainer is world renowned and respected and charging all this money for to training are they respectful are they are they still a good person are they still the same person i think that's a big deal and buddy for you there's so many people i said well I, you know sometimes i'll put you up on my story if we're in the hamptons or at dinner and they said was that buddy velasco on your story and, and it's weird it's like people my daughter's a huge fan I'm a huge fan. My brother watches the show all the time. Everybody's like, I've been watching that show for five years. It's one of my favorite shows. It's incredible the different age or generations that you touch. It's yep. kids, it's adults, it's grandparents. Like everyone loves the show. 
Well, you know, when I started doing the show, like, and again, I'm a realist, right? What I did the show to grow my business, make my family business a household yeah, name, and make money. I mean, right. that that's true. Yes. Like, like I, I, I'm not a saint. No, nothing wrong. You know, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, I ain't gonna, yeah. gonna bullshit you. But after the second and third season, I started to then you talk to the fans and you realize what the show means for them. Okay, when I do Cake Boss, it's me being me. And I don't realize it, but when I talk about a cake, there's no impossibility. I'm almost like a kid dreaming it. It's almost like a cartoon, like, hey, I can make this fucking cake fly today. I'm gonna make this cake fly. You know, and it's like, how do I figure out how to make this cake fly? And I, in the beginning, just, it's my effort, my, you know, it's my grit, right, it's who right, I am right. in my DNA. But when I meet a kid and they say, do you know why I love your show? Because it inspires me that I can do anything in this world. Well, it's like, holy shit, I can't give up. Like now the bar is even set higher. Right, right. Or when I hear the mom tell me, you know, I want to thank you. And oh, well, no, my pleasure. And she says, you know, my son isn't into sports. You know, he's a little overweight. He, he likes to He likes to bake and cook. He's into arts. He gets picked on in school. But your show made it cool for him That's to awesome. be able to be a baker. That's awesome. Like, you know, you, you, you hear somebody who says, uh, my, my sister was in a hospital getting chemo treatments and she watches your show and it makes it feel like back home with your crazy families like my crazy family. And it just got her through her chemo. And it's like, you know, this show means a lot more to a lot more lot of people out oh, yeah. there oh, yeah. and then it doesn't become about the money right then it becomes about hey i'm trying to make great a great show that's going to be inspirational that you know you can watch as a family right. that is going to do all these little things for people yeah powerful ripple effect it touches everyone and, and everyone sees like such a special message in it. and that's what i saw i think we were in the Hamptons, and when I saw the cake at was it the the Bravo or the Discovery? What was it? Uh, a Discovery. Discovery party. Yeah, yeah, Discovery. Party. When I saw that cake, well, there was a shark. But the year before <laughs> that, I thought it was like a bicycle, with, and, and it was like moving. Oh, yeah, it was pretty and it, wild, and it, and it was all edible. <laughs> I, was thinking, How? I just kind of stood there for about twenty minutes, thinking like I, I don't understand that. Like it was beyond my stratosphere to understand how that was done. Well. Well, I got one better for you. The two years before, because we we built a cake so big and, and it was all edible that we couldn't get it up the stairs. We 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 had to set the cake down at that same party. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, up those main stairs. You couldn't walking. you couldn't get up the stairs, and the security team was there, and they were like, I mean, and again, this this is a huge party. I mean, you know, huge. I mean, you could have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the who's yeah, who yeah. Oh, there. Oh, oh, Oprah was Oprah's there. Oprah's there. Seinfeld. Yeah, it's Seinfeld. Crazy. I mean, you name it. Um, and this cake was so big that it was like an episode of Cake Boss, right? You you you, <laughs> you think like we make this shit yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. It's and like, it's heavy. Hey, it's heavy. It. Dude, the cake had a way. They said we need a forklift, and we couldn't get it here to get it a up. A forklift there. for the cake. You had to get a forklift because the cake was probably the size of this room. It was probably like you know on a on you know maybe like twelve by by five board. The cake Did probably you get a weighed. Forklift? No, we couldn't. We had to leave the cake there because we didn't know we wasn't going to be able to get left. Oh, that's right. That's why we set up the bottom. There of the was stairs. a bottom of the stairs that's that right. year. That's it right. was nuts. <laughs> that's wild, man. But, I just think about your creativity when you make them. And what, what is there one specific that you're most proud of that you remember? Um, definitely probably the Transformer Cake and Cake Boss years, but this new show I'm doing with Buddy Verse Duff, it's pretty amazing because um it really brought me back to to really digging in creatively and it was just me and Ralph, so it was only two of us. Mm -hmm. And the amount of cake that we were able to do in like eight or 10 or 12 hours was incredible. Our finale cake, we worked four days on it, we were allowed. We worked 20 hours a day. I slept in my office at work. Again, listen, you know me. You've, yeah. been, you've been around with me. Yeah, yeah. The last thing I need to do is work 
20 hours a day. <laughs> like, you know, I could stay in my mansion and, <laughs> and hang out or whatever, you know, but it's not who I am in my DNA. Like, you know, I get up, I'm in the grind of it. And, and what me and Ralph accomplished on this, it might be my biggest accomplishment yet. Yeah. Like, you know, and... And I had to drag Ralph to through it yeah. because he was like lagging, and you know sometimes you got to be the general. Yeah. And and again, you know, look, and and that's what I love here about anatomy. When you walk through, you hear that pump, that energy, that that drive, that everybody's connected, and every just that culture, right, that yeah. you created. Yeah. Well, I got to create the same culture with my employees. Yeah, for sure. I walk in that day, and I'll never forget it because I do a lot of my thinking when I'm driving. So, like, my wife will call me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I, you know, I, I can't talk now because I got a half an hour ride to work. Right. And I and I just think. Thought. And yeah. wheel, the wheels are spinning and, and, and I know that I'm, I'm going up against Duff. I know what the finale theme is. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, what am I going to make? And I start dreaming of this cake. And I go in and I grab my whole team and I'm like, all right, I got the idea. This is what we're going to do. Right? And they're like you're fucking crazy like there's no like they're like there's no way that you're gonna pull this off and and literally i fought with them for 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 like two hours and i was like i don't give a shit this is what we're gonna make i was like there's no way that we're not gonna make this cake and we did we we really made i mean it was incredible and and again it had to be fair i mean there was no it was me and ralph Nobody else was allowed to touch a cake, you know, fix the board. Like, we had to do everything. And tell Ralph, uh, who, uh, the audience, who Ralph is. So, Ralph is uh, one of my head decorators or sculptors at the bakery. He's amazingly talented. How long has he been with you? He's with me almost 10 years now. Wow. It was funny. Another true story is, is again, how do you, like, when I see talent, I pick it up. So... He comes in, I and I do a lot of charity stuff, um, and I did a, like a cake decorating class. If you know, like a, uh, what do you call it? Like a bid. So they people uh, like a silent auction. Okay. So people could bid on, hey, a cake decorating class with the cake boss. Oh, cool. So I, I do a lot of that for charity, and then his uncle bought bought the the thing. Mm -hmm. So he comes in with his wife, his kids, and he brings Ralph. And at the time, Ralph went to art school and he really didn't have a job. Okay. And um, he brings him into the class and Ralph's like, you know, I've been watching the show. And he takes a little bit of fondant and before you know it, he, he makes a little dinosaur. And I and mark in two minutes and I'm like, holy shit. I go, that, that was amazing. I go, well, what do you do? He's like, I don't remember where he was working, but he didn't really, he wasn't really working. So you got to work here. And that was the first time I said, you know, maybe I don't need cake decorators. I need artists. I need people who are artists because if you give him the medium, he figures out, figures out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you give him modeling chalk, you give him fond on, you give him different things. And, and um, I hired him and then I started to hire. I started not looking for bakers or decorators but looking mm -hmm. for artists and um it's interesting and and you know he he's amazingly talented but we we have a tremendous amount of respect for each other mm -hmm. and we we both have very specific eyes look there's certain things and i tell people this all the time I can't give you what I have in here. I can't give you what I have in my heart. I can't give you the way I look at the world or, you know, the way I, like when I look at a cake, I step back and it's like I scan it and I'm like top to bottom and I'm like, all right, where's the focal point? Is there enough color bringing it? Do I see any flaws or blemishes? Like, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, I step back and it doesn't matter if it's an abstract cake, if it's a floral cake, if it's a traditional cake, I see beauty in all of them. Right? I really do. It's what this cake should look like. And Ralph has got the same ability, you know, um, being a master with color and stuff like that. And it takes time. You know, it's not something that, that happens overnight. Right. So you're, 
what's it like now with you, your family, uh, your wife, your children? What what has their uh, experience been in involvement with like the bakery? Do they work in the bakery as you did? You know. Well, my kids definitely help out in the bakery. Probably not to the extent that I did. Okay. I you know, um, and sometimes I I almost say to myself, I wish they could, mm-hmm. because it, it was just such a life lesson for me. Yeah, it's powerful. You know, um, and, and again, listen, certain people. The more that, you know, because you look at life different now. I'm 41, right? You step back and I look at life different and I meet people. I mean, I meet heads of networks and heads of funds and billionaires and millionaires and, and regular people and everything else. And there's a common denominator be, between a lot of successful people. And a lot of it is that will, that drive. They're a little crazy. They're obsessive compulsive in the way they do things. They got ADD. They... You know, they could hear something for 30 seconds and they're going to get the hell out of here. And you start to see these clusters or you start to understand this, you know, because again, I'm a dot connector, right? And then you're talking to this guy and you see kind of what the attention span is or what it is. Right. And it's like a lot of these very successful people have these certain attributes. And you know that if you're, I don't, not that you can't learn them or not that you can't hone them. But you're born a certain way. Right. If you look at the world a certain way, you're going to be successful. I'll give you a quick story. Please. My my assistant um, was with my son, Buddy. He was probably like six or seven years old. And they were in the car together. And, and um, they, they were going somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. And... I think they had to make a stop and do this and do this. And him at six years old, he's like, but why? And and again, he's listening to her have a conversation and he butts and he's like, no, but why don't we do this first and then go here and then go there? And she calls me up. She's like, he's he's a mini you. He's like, he thinks like you. He's like, like, and he was right. He's <laughs> like, he was, he was like, he was, he, he, like, like he wanted to, he wanted to solve the problem. Like, he, he kind of, like, looked at it and said, hey, no, this doesn't make sense. Why are you not doing like this? The thing is, I didn't teach him. It, it's you're born that way. Right. It's what are those things that bother you or, mm-hmm. you know, look, I'm a problem solver. Whether my sisters are fighting and I got to solve the problem, whether the bakery's on fire and I got to solve the problem, whether That's I got to do it, Whatever it is, you bring me your problem, I'm going to figure it out. That's amazing because now as you say this, I'm thinking... There are certain people in this world, like Buddy, who are problem solvers. Then there's certain people in this world that are problem finders. Exactly. And they don't know how to be a part of the solution. Exactly. When, when I see a problem, I'm like, I need to fix that. I need to figure out a way to make that more optimal and more efficient. Let me, how do I get more people to experience anatomy? How do I get more people in our community? Like, we need to figure out how we can touch more people. And that's why I think we get along so well, because yeah. I see that in you and, and I see the culture here and I see what you're trying to do. And and again, the humble beginnings. And, and yeah. I mean, listen, your story is an amazing story. I appreciate you know, it. from, you know, being, being that kid that got picked on, and then, you know, saying, hey, look, you know, you turned that switch on, right? Yeah. Said, oh, hey, yeah. look, you know what? And and oh, yeah. you got that switch and you know, like, look at your life, your career, where you are today. Because you, when you have to turn that switch on, you turn it on and there's no failing. Yeah. That means a lot. Thanks, buddy. Thank no, you. No, it, it's, it's yeah. the truth. I mean, and, and I think, you know, people don't realize that that's the, that's the path to success. Yeah. It's it, it, what you just said, you know, to have that switch on. But what you said earlier is like, you think you could outwork. You said it's going to come full, full circle. So I want to hear right. about you that. You want to hear about that. Yeah. yeah, All yeah, right. yeah. Because, so, you know, real quick, like you have to put in the work. You know, we talk about the, the book, The 4-Hour Work Week. Have you heard it with Tim Ferriss? There's a reason the book, The 4-Hour Work Week is the most popular book in America because everyone's trying to find a shortcut. Yeah, you don't have it in you to take a shortcut. I don't have it in no. me to take a shortcut, right. unfortunately. Right. Right. It's not about not working smarter. It's just about we know we have to put a certain amount of work in. That's Listen it. again. I tell people in my office and in my company, I'm the hammer. When you need the hammer, you call on the hammer. 
Hammers. Yeah. That's what you need. Show me a nail. Show me the nail, yeah. and I'm going to hammer it in. Right. Okay? I don't want to micromanage. I don't want to whatever. Mm-hmm. But when I call up the vendor and say, hey, when the hell are you going to do this? They come. It's not maybe. It's not what if. Whatever. That's the only time that I want to be involved. Right. I don't want to be there and say, yeah. oh, where's the vendors and stuff like that. Because if you have to be involved all the time, it won't work. You can't. Okay. And and again, the problem with me is I always wanted to outwork my problems, outwork my problems. And I really started to have panic attacks. It started to because, again, you wake up and, you, you know, you're driving. You're like, too I can't much. breathe. You just, got, you just got too much shit going on. And, um, and now, over the last, I'd say, about eight years, I know when it, when it happens... I could, I could, and again, no medication. Right. I don't need medic. I really like, not that I, there's anything against it, right, right, but right. I just know it's coming, and I just could kind of mentally get it out of my head and breathe. And I'll call my wife, and you know, I'll just have a five minute conversation and breathe and relax, and then you know, be able to kind of delegate the problems. But the thing is, is I don't care who you are, you cannot do it all. Okay. Yeah. A, I don't care who you are, you're going to have success and failure. Yeah. Okay? And I didn't know failure. I didn't, like, like in my life, I didn't know failure. And I'll never forget it. I was talking with Emerald's manager. It was way back earlier. By the way, from Fall River, Massachusetts. Yeah. Hometown. Yeah. 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 We, we, we talked about that today. And uh, Randy said, I wonder if... But he's good friends with Emerald. Are you good friends with him? I, I, I mean, I'm not good friends, right. but I am friends with okay. him. I actually, it's funny. I told him yesterday at the Food and Wine Festival. I said, Emerald, if you don't take me fishing on your boat, we're done. He's like, done. He's like, you're coming. You know, he was just so friendly and, awesome. and nice. But I remember in the success, he said to to my guy and me, he said, you guys got to understand failure because everything you do isn't going to work. Right. Right. And again, so you and again, no matter how many things you have, you cannot be good at a million things, or you cannot be focused on just one thing. You have to do what you're good at, mm-hmm. right? And if you're filming and you're traveling and you got a TV and you got this line and you have that, da, 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 something's going to give. Right. I don't care how good you are. It's true. You, you're gonna. But um, for me, it was giving. It was like taking a step back, looking at what's working. And looking at what's not working and trying to say, all right, look, I don't need this in my life. I, I'm, it's not it's not efficient. It's it's not, the juice is not worth the squeeze. That's one of the things right, that, right, you right. know, so it's just not really in it. So um, take bakeries. My vision for bakeries, like I, I go and say, what was my dream? My dream was I was a neighborhood bakery. Mm-hmm. I wanted to open a neighborhood bakery on every avenue or every main street in America and get somebody like a me and say, hey, look, this is your store and, and you're going to be me and I'm going to train you for a month and then you're going to be me. Well, that shit doesn't happen because there's not too many of me's out there. How many people want to wake up at 4 a.m., 3 a.m. and then do it all day and then do it all day with a smile on their face and say, you know what? I can't wait to do it again tomorrow. They they don't. And the thing is, is again, no matter what, it's years and years and years of experience. And I'm and a quick learner. For, and then do it for decades. Yeah. People are like, dude, it's not worth the squeeze. It's not. It's, it's not. It's, right? Exactly. So we opened some bakeries in locations where... Um, and, and, and had problems with managers because of the fact that they're not going to be me, you know, and then leases end and you close bakeries, you know, yeah. and, and I closed down some bakeries. So, you know, you know how hard that was Oof. for me to swallow that pill of saying, like, how do you how do I do that? Because, again, in my mind, it never fell or right. I never think that I can't fix something. Right. right. So I had to learn that. I had to learn to understand failure, accept it, and move on. Right. But learn a lesson from it. You know, learn the lesson that, hey, real estate choices are the yeah. most important. Oh, yeah. Location. It's location, location, location. Oh, yeah. You know, so... Um, you can't work your way out of those. You can. And there's just certain things to say, hey, you know what? Throw in the towel and, and I'm going to move on. Lesson learned. And, right? But being not being afraid to admit it. Not being afraid to say, hey, I made a mistake and own up to it. And not only that, but 
go into your pocket and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, look, I, I lost. You know, yeah. everything in business and everything in life is a gamble. Right. And there's risk associated with it. It's how much risk. So I was able to um, learn that the hard way. You know, and, and again, I just never thought that it was going to come. You just you get into the grind and things are thrown at you and you're just like, yeah, I could do this and I could do this and I could do this and I could do this. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you want to do the things that make the most sense and the things that you know that you're going to be the best at. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I am right now in my life. Um, and I, I feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I feel like a smarter businessman because I had those failures or because yeah. I, you know, I had to learn the hard way where, look, you know, I lost a million dollars or I lost that $2 million or whatever it is, you know? I mean, it, you learn these lessons the hard way. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and and it's it's real. It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not bullshit. But I always believe in karma. Like, I, I, I'm a true believer in, even if I'm, don't want to be in a deal anymore or if if i'm trying to get out of something i always want to be like hey listen i want to understand your perspective how are you looking at this how do we shake hands and you're happy and i'm happy and and we go our separate ways mm -hmm. because i feel like in life that's the most important thing and i think that when you are good to people i feel like good things happen right. i feel like you know the more good that you do like, again, being down here in South Beach, there's walking around and stuff. You see a lot of homeless people. Yeah. And this is something that I do. Every time I see a homeless person, I stop and give them money. No matter what. And I'll never forget how it started. Because when I was a kid and I was with my dad, every time he would see someone homeless, he would stop and give them money. So I was probably a kid and I said, you know, dad, why do you always give, you know, money to the homeless or to, or to people who are less fortunate? And he looked at me and he said, you know, when I grew up in Sicily, me, my mother and my sister, we used to split an orange. That's all we had to eat. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be poor. Right. And he said to me, that could be God asking me to help him. And he said, how can I not help? And he said, what is, what is a couple bucks going to matter to me? Look how blessed I am. Yeah. And it sunk in. And again, like every night, and this is something that he did, not something that I did. Any extra cake at the bakery goes to a homeless shelter. Like that was something like on, on the holidays when me and him would finish the bakery, whatever pies were left over, we would put in the back of the van. We would go to the Hoboken shelter on Thanksgiving Day That's and amazing. bring them there and then go home to, to our Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Um, and those are the lessons that, that I was taught that make you who you are. Mm -hmm. And again, for me to give a couple homeless people, I, I, you know, what yeah. you feel so good and it's something that I teach my kids and you don't know. Listen, yeah. Mark, that could be me one day yeah. and hope to, and, and hopefully never. I know. But I know. if, that is me. Hopefully, somebody's going to be nice enough to help me when I need that help. Yeah, I tell I tell my uh, close circle of friends and family, I always say, you never know how what's going to happen in life. Like, no one wakes up and says, you know what? I, I think I've decided to be a homeless person. Yeah, life happens, and all of a sudden, you end up in a spot where you don't know how to get out of it. So, hopefully. There's some uh, empathetic and understanding people in this world that can uh, contribute to big deal. You listen, you got to always listen. You being a problem solver, you got to hear both sides of the story. Mm. And you got to kind of like, all right, let me walk in this guy's shoes before I judge him. Yeah, for sure. You know, sure. I, I don't like gossip. I'm not like yeah. a big gossip guy. Like even when I, I'm like, I, I don't want to hear. I don't give yeah. a shit. Like I, I live my life. I work hard, you know. Do the right things and everything takes care of itself. You know. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny. I um. I go to work every day at the factory, and you would you would think that I go in, in my chef coat, I go in at six in the morning, and I go set the line up, and the line is basically you know hey we're making ten thousand cakes today we're making this we're making that, and I go in and I'm so heavily involved in it still. And and people are still baffled. Like my my you know plant manager is like, 
you know, and but he keeps him on his toes because he's like, yeah, buddy can show up and, he, and you know, again, this week I'm here in South Beach, but Monday guarantees he knows that I'm going to be there no matter <laughs> what at 6 a.m. and that everything better be clean and everything better be running right and, and efficiencies and stuff like that right. because it's the way my mind works. I look at that and it was funny as we grew, we started one bakery. Now we have 20 bakeries, right? So making cake for one bakery is one thing. Making it for 20 bakeries is another thing. So I had to make the cakes with the guys. And we're like, all right, so how many cakes can we make in a day? The old-fashioned way. Four, five hundred, right? That, that's how many cakes, like little cakes. You four cakes. or five hundred the old-fashioned way? The old-fashioned way. In a, a day. lot of cakes. Like, no? you know, kind of cutting them by hand. Filling them with the bags, icing them on the turntables, doing it that way and stuff like that. With a staff of how many? Um, we probably were a staff of probably like eight or nine. Oh. So, um, so serious we, workers. Serious workers. And we yeah. would just crank and make cakes and go and go. And I had to do that work to say, okay, we need, we, every time you put six cakes on a pan, put it in a rack, pull it off the rack, you know, switching that. It's time. Oh, yeah. How do we get this into a conveyor? All right, get a conveyor here. All right, let's start with this. All right, now let's get a slicer. So we get the thing, we throw the cakes on, somebody opens them, it slices. Then it goes on to a food grade conveyor. Somebody kind of puts the cakes out. And we have this machine called the Cake-O-Matic, which was so funny because we had it in our factory. Nobody ever used it. So basically, you, you take the cake, you put it on this thing, there's a foot pedal, and it just spin. Oh. It spins and puts the icing right on the cake, right? And then you put another layer, and you just kind of like build the cakes. Wow. Then we started a production line where then they were the cakes were filled, and then they were going on another conveyor, and then we would pick them up, ice them quick, and put them down. And then I bought another cake matic where it actually comes and ices the cake for you, right? So now, in an eight-hour shift with eight people, we could do 10,000 cakes, from five. Ooh. And I put that line together in my head. I remember with you these told me guys. this in the Hamptons that you had to systematically put each piece together to save time. That's it. And the only way that I could do it is by, you know, look, again, cannolis. I, I get my guys together. All right, what's the choke point? The fryers. Because how many, how many can you fit in a fryer? And how many, you know, how long does it take? That's your choke point. There's always like, what's your choke point? How many ovens you have? It's not how many you could, you know, make and squirt and, and ready to, you know, deposit. It's all right. Every three minutes and 60 sec. every three minutes, we can do um, 60 cannoli shells. We have six fryers, you know, which means 15 an hour, you know, and, and, and you, so again, you have to choke the fryers. So I need to know that I have enough people here between cutting, between sticking and whatever, so that when you take a, a rack of cannoli, um, a tray of cannolis in, mm -hmm. another one goes out, in and out, so that you're doing 15 screens per hour per fryer. And and, and you see, but you, when you, unless I do it, unless I'm physically there and go through every single step, that's how detailed I am in it. Like I first, all right, so how are we going to make the dough and then we're going to cut it and we're going to press it and then, you know, get automated equipment right. and then it goes into a cutting table and, and it's going to get picked system, up. You have to feel the system, right? You have, you to, have to feel the system and that's the way my mind works because mm -hmm. everything to me is a system. Like even if I'm flying somewhere, like, all right, so I'm traveling, I'm going to land at this time and then, oh, you know what? I, I also had to stop in Vegas and I, you know, to me, the world is a system. And I kind of want to be involved in it. And that's mm -hmm. the way I look at things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, that's part of what my success is. It's incredible. I, I With me in regards to training, people tell me, hey, you're, you're not a business owner. You're a business operator. I said, I have to be, even if I'm an owner, I have to be an operator. The reason being is because I need to be able to touch the training so I can look over to my right and left and see the training to see how I can try to help them optimize what they're doing make life easier for them so they can put out better results for their clients and make sure they have an optimal working space. So I can't step away from that because I need to make sure that 
I'm feeling what they're feeling. Absolutely. It's so important, you know? And also, too, keeping up in the trends. Right. So, again, so especially, relevant, in, your, especially in, your, in, in what you do, you know? And, and again, you're probably like me. Once in a while, you can go in the back and kick a little ass and show them that you still got it. Yeah. You know, it's them. important. I, I want to make sure that they, they say, hey, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. And that, for us, that's continuing education. Like, if I'm not here and training myself, training clients or working on business stuff, my only free time, I'm trying to learn something that I don't know. And I say, there's a lot that I don't know. Yeah. And I want to understand it because the amount of times that I've worked with people and actually helped them have a better quality of life, that's enough motivation for me to get my head in a book and just read something and learn. And again, you're smart enough to know that you don't know it all. No, and, 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 and listen, you know... Think about it. I tell people all the time, I'm the cake boss. I'm probably the, the most well-known baker in the world. Right. Okay. But I could still learn. And I'm still very humble about it. And and I and I and I love my fans and I love what I do. And I still work. Where do you think that comes from, that that humbleness? That my parents. Have? Yeah. Oh, my par my my parents. And then listen, Mark, I grew up pretty well off. Mm -hmm. I mean I mean my dad my again, my dad's story is even better than mine because he came here with nothing. I mean, zero, zero, zero. From he didn't have shoes from Sicily. He was 13 years old, worked in a bakery. By the time he was 26, he made a deal with the baker because the Carlos son wanted to work for NASA, which he did. <laughs> he was a rocket scientist, literally. And my dad was, he says, let me buy it from you. And Mr. Carlo gave my dad the loan. And, and, and you know, he bought the bakery and he turned it from two or three people into a bakery that was like 30 people. And then he he was an entrepreneur. He had that. You know how I said my son has the attributes. Yeah. I have the attributes. My dad had them, so he bought property. And my, my dad was a millionaire. I mean, literally, he right. died. But but a hardworking, right. humble guy took care of his family, um, and and set things up. But just because he was a millionaire, and we, listen, we lived in a a big house. You know, um, we, we, I lived a great life. We went on vacations if I wanted nice stuff. But my dad always says, you like nice shit? Well, then you got to work. Oh, yeah. And he brought me and showed me how to work and, and understand it and stuff like that. So I wasn't spoiled. Right. You know, right. At, even though I was well off, I was not spoiled. And I think that being raised that way is what keeps me who I am today. Right. You know, I, I always saw my parents remaining humble. Right. The biggest testimony to my dad was when he died and the, the funeral was three days. And when I tell you there was lines of people waiting to go s to see him, to say goodbye, showed the kind of man that he was. And everybody who, who he met or, you know, met me, you know what your father did for me? When I came from Italy or he helped me pick out a house, like he was a community guy. And again, I, and sometimes my, me and my sisters, they would argue about this because I got it that it wasn't because I was Buddy Velastro's son. People got to respect me for what I do. Right. All right. Buddy Velastro, my dad is going to open the door for me, but when the door is open, I have to prove to them it's what I'm going to do for them that's going to make them not be able to say no to me right. or go the extra mile for me right. or whatever. And listen, my friends know it. And I still got the same friends. Like, it's not like I have a lot of friends, but still the my old friends are my old friends. Right. I haven't changed. I, I never will change. I'll always be there for my friends. And, and you know, that's just the way you are. Like, mm -hmm. that's something that I was ingrained in my head and. I'll, I'll always be that way. It's awesome, man. And, and, and I can attest to that every time I've been out with Buddy. Like he, uh, you know, he's not the guy that, you know, is just looking to spend time with all the celebs. Like he, he brings you, brought your family here with you this weekend. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Vinny and uh, Mark. Yep. My yeah, cousins from here. here. And um, that, that's just incredible. But that speaks volumes of who you are. So honestly, thank you for being that way. And thank you for always being uh so kind to me whenever nah. we're out, but that, that's really cool. Um, so you're here for Food and Wine Festival. You do it every year. Yeah. Um, well, uh, now starting now, every year. Now. 
Yeah. What, so tell me about the weekend for you. It's packed with things. So, you know, some great events we, we had, and we have one more today. But it's been an amazing, you know, time. Mm -hmm. uh, who doesn't love being in South Florida yeah, at this time of year? It, it's so amazing. I got an ice cream social. I did some cake decorating demos. Actually, this year I got to spend a lot more time with some of the other chefs, mm -hmm. the celebrity chefs. I mean, look, we all know each other. Hello, goodbye. We, you know, if we call each other and we help each other with different foundations and things like that, or go on each other's shows, that's great. But to be able to spend some time with those people and and uh, get to know them a little bit better, like I did, I think was was uh, really amazing. Right. You know, and uh, do you have a favorite, another chef or an, another baker that you work with that, that you just love working with them? Someone you could highlight? Oh, wow. Um, I know there's many, but there's yeah, there's one. so many. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people who, who are amazing and amazingly talented to work with. You know, I, I like working with all of them, I really yeah. do. I, I, I couldn't pick one, it was like picking my favorite child. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, last thing. I know you're short on time. Thank you once again for doing this. It's been incredible. Oh, but my pleasure, brother. If you could give one piece of advice to a young person who's on their journey or on the path to doing something that's really important to them, what's give them one piece of advice to follow? That's that's great. Well, listen, the first thing is you have to dream big. You got to really believe that you can do it. You have to work your ass off you have to not be scared to work you got to believe in yourself do it from the heart never ever give up and at the end of the day you gotta turn that switch on you gotta make it happen oh yeah whatever you gotta do to make it happen however you gotta do it you gotta slam it nail it hammer it you gotta do it you gotta go after it you gotta believe that you can do it and you gotta drive it all the way home because nobody's going to sell you like you. Nobody's going to do it for you like yourself. And if you aren't willing to make those sacrifices, then you're always going to say, why me, why me? Or I could have, should have, would have. Right. The doers do it. Do you want to be a doer or not? It's awesome, man. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank you. That was incredible. My Thank pleasure, so brother. Really Anytime. Thank you. You got it.